I guess, more for you from one reality. Um, if you've seen or you've come across my channel, then you know that one of my first videos was a response to one reality talking about examining your Christianity. And, well, um, I've subscribed to that channel, um, One Reality, because um, I like to be exposed to points of view that I don't necessarily agree with. And so he has another video out. Um, the title of it is How to Stop Sinning and Live Sin-Free. Um, subtext of it is um, Holiness Preaching. But if I was to title this video, I think I would call it something along the lines, um, you spelt holiness wrong. Um, not because he spelt holiness as in like righteous or purity in that context wrong, but um, holiness as in H-O-L-E, like a depression in the ground. Um, because just the whole idea of holiness theology, at least as he presents it, um, it's full of holes. It's full of gaps, which... Um, are not supported by um, the biblical narrative and that are not supported by Christian tradition or um, historical uh, Christian teachings. And um, in a lot of ways, I'd say that put him also in the camp of like Pelagianism, which was denounced as heresy. But um, I digress. Let's actually go in and look at what he says. <laughs> He begins from a point of let's define sin, which is good. Um, it's always important if we're going to talk about a subject matter, we understand the nature of the terms we're using in that subject. And if we're going to talk about being sinless, then we need to know what sin is. And he begins from 1 John 3, 4. And I should also mention maybe that when I first came across um, the way that he speaks, I thought for sure that he would be a King James Version onlyist. Why did I think that? Because he quotes from the King James Version a lot. But I guess that's turned out to be true. He has used the English Standard Version, and he's also used the New Living Translation at various times. But I think you should note, um, when you're looking across... And when you're hearing people speak, um, they if people have an ideology or a pet theology more than they have a good hermeneutic, something they will often do is they will cherry pick the version of a verse that fits um, kind of on its language the idea they want to sell with it rather than approaching the text with, what is it saying? And then how can I apply what it is saying? They will purposely fish for versions that say what they want it to say so that it fits what they want it to mean. Uh, but he uses that um, as basically to come to the conclusion that a command of the law is required for something to be sin, more or less. That's what he said. Except... Um, are you trying to say that there was no such thing um, prior to the reception of the law in uh, the 20th chapter of Exodus? But what he does is he sums that up. He says the greatest commandment is um, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the greatest commandment, and it is Matthew chapter 22, which, I mean, you can make an argument for that. The whole law is summed up there. We have further evidence against this idea because um, Paul, in his own testimony, which he gives, and he describes himself as being the perfect follower of the law. He was the franchise player of the Jewish law, and yet, what did that drive him to do? persecute Christians. So even though he had the boxes ticked, he was born on at the right time, and he was uh, circumcised on the right day, and he was um, mentored by the right person, 
and he had Roman citizenship, and, like, he had all that, he had everything you could want, and yet all of that, it didn't culminate with him being like Christ. It didn't culminate with him being merciful and gracious. It didn't culminate with him crucifying him, uh, his sinful lusts. What that resulted in is him crucifying believers in Christ. Now, he goes from that to um, asking a little bit of what I would say is a straw man in saying that if you can stop sinning for one second, then you can do for a minute. And if you do so for a minute, then you can do for an hour. And if you can do so for an hour, then you can do so for a day. And if you do so for a day, you can go a week and then a month and a year and for the rest of your life. I would ask multiple questions, however. Um, first of all, obviously, the way that you manage one second of time is not the same way that you manage a lifetime of time. Because a lifetime is potentially infinite, as far as I know. It's Time progresses linearly from the point of your conception to the point of your death, and you don't know when that will be. So, um, in the same way, you would not manage a single penny or a single quarter. You would not manage this this amount of money in the same way that you would manage a trillion dollars or a hundred trillion dollars or a hundred million or infinite amounts of money. You wouldn't manage them in the same way because they're different. So the process or the approach for remaining sinless in one second is not the same as remaining sinless for a lifetime. It doesn't work. The more you try to add laws, the less people are interested in following them. Furthermore, the more you try to add laws, the people who are sh truly trying to keep them, the more those laws are added, the less likely people are to actually be able to keep them. And that's one of the reasons why businesses and stuff keep lawyers on retainer, that we're constantly in violation of various things. We just don't know. That's why the fire department comes in and inspects your business and tells you, hey, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this anymore, the code's been updated. That's also the reason why there's an expiration point on building uh, diagrams that you have for a new construction project, because after a while, laws change, and then the way you you were going to run the water lines or the electrical back then when um, those building plans were ratified it they're no longer valid he evokes the days of noah saying that anyone who believes that you can't um go even one second which honestly is there anyone that even believes that that is such a clear straw man even still he says that um you've lumped yourself in with the people of noah's age the noetic age that um, God actually had to do a rinse cycle on the earth in order to rid it of it of its evil. However, um, in Genesis 8.21, um, Noah has sacrificed an animal. And um, after coming out of the ark, him, his three sons, and their four collected wives are the only people left on the planet. The only ones. And yet God's response to seeing the sacrifice, he takes in the aroma and says that he'll never destroy all the earth on behalf of the sinfulness of man again, even though it's every inclination of his heart is only evil all of the time. There's only eight people left, and yet his conclusion about mankind is only evil from his youth. And you can see this with children. I mean, they're you're not they're not taught how to lie. They're taught you have to teach them how to be truthful. You don't have to teach them how to steal. You have to teach them how to not steal. Now let's talk temptation. He loves to quote to, and he even says this in the video. But he loves to quote to First Corinthians ten thirteen, which is no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what your, your ability to bear, but with temptation he will also provide a way out so that you may be able to endure it. He takes this verse and uses it as a conclusion to say, see, God's not going to let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. 
However, I would ask the question of, then why did Adam sin? If Adam was not tempted beyond what he could bear, why did he give in to the sin? The verse right before it, which says, be careful if you think you stand, for you may fall. Now, he takes this as like, well, you have free will. Uh, you have free will. God has given you free will, and that sin is a free choice that you can make. I would thoroughly question, what is his definition of free will? Pivoting into the point of how do we stop sinning. Now, I think from the first part of this video, I think, um, I don't think that he's presented um, the kind of dilemma we're in very honestly or very accurately with the idea of that if you can stop sinning for one second, then you can stop sinning for all lifetime. I think that that's ridiculous, quite frankly. Like, just that comparison. Um, here he puts uh, James 1, 14 through 16 in, and... It's basically, uh, each person is tempted when he's dragged away by his own lusts and enticed. If you're dragged away by your own lusts, like, he questions the existence of a sin nature here, um, here and earlier in the video. If that there's a myth of a sin nature which is given over to sin and flesh, where I would assert that, quite honestly, he just doesn't have a right view of what is known as biblical anthropology, which this goes to the roots of um, kind of Christendom as a whole. There's always been a little bit of a disagreement about um, the truth of what mankind is. Um, Christianity has wrestled with this greatly. There's been church councils about it. Um, to the point where there were certain camps of Christendom that would deny that Jesus Christ was really a human being because they believed that anything that is of the flesh or um, bound in flesh is inherently evil. And then there's others that would say that he wasn't fully God because um, him being a perfect man was sufficient for him to be able to sacrifice. Like there's been a lot of disagreements there. But notice, um, if you want, you can just go through the video yourself and just kind of set a counter for yourself. How many times he says choose, choice, um, decide, or m any variation of those terms? Because he says them a lot. And he clearly says that it's your freedom to choose whether you will be righteous or unrighteous, whether you'll be sinful or sinless. And it's a fascinating thing because I think on the one hand, sort of true. Um, going to, back to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, of that you do choose at one point to like, nope, I don't care what God wants for me. I'm just going to do this thing. I know it's unhealthy. I know it's going to blow up my marriage. I know that it's a bad decision, but I'm going to just do it anyway. My question is that um, if it's true, that it's just a choice, then as the author of his own video, why hasn't he just cloistered himself in a, like a 4x4 four four concrete box by himself? Like, I can't choose to be sinful now. Um, there's no way for anything that could tempt me to get in, except he's in there. <laughs> He progresses from there, talking about how those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with their passions and desires. That's Galatians 5.24. So, um, how are we supposed to crucify our flesh? But he says that, well, this should lead to an, in an instant stopping of sin. An instant. So, let's say if you give your life to Christ at VBS at 10 years old, that child should never sin again in, its, in his lifetime. 
what he literally says is you're not going to be doing stuff that you hate. So the reason I've tied those two statements together is that they're just incredibly naive. For two reasons. One's a little superficial, the other one's a little more profound. The first is, I work in retail. You think I'd go throughout a day never having to do things that I hate every once in a while? I, I mean, I've lived long enough to realize that just life is full of things which you can hate and yet you have to do anyways, or that you are compelled to by an external force, I guess you would say, to do them anyways, whether that's washing dishes, I mean, some of the more mani kind of menial stuff, washing dishes and doing laundry, or if that's something more like, I mean, I have to go to work. I don't want to have to go to work, but I go to work. Like, there are things that you just, you ha you do. Some of those are more innocent, and some of those things are not. And this is something that's actually reflected in Scripture. Scripture is honest enough with us to be true about what humanity is. In um, Romans 7, which is adjacent to the passage that he's trying to use uh, earlier, the Romans 6 one, but in Romans 7, Paul actually starts talking about um, his opinion on the matter of what whether a person can stop sinning. And I brought it up in the previous video that do you really believe yourself to be better than Paul? Because in Romans 7, he says that what a wretched man that I am. Like, that's just the whole passage from 7 down to 25. That's just him saying this over and over again. Over again. The law is exposed in me, this um, fleshly uh, compulsion to do evil. And I am powerless. Literally, I am dead comes down to, like I said, a false biblical anthropology. He views humanity wrongly. He views a strength in them to resist sin that just does not reside there. And he, uh, as a result, he is what um, Galatians refers to as putting your faith into the law. Believing that the law can save. It was in the same way that if I have cancer inside my body, I go down, I get an MRI, and it shows that I've got a mass um, affixed onto my left ventricle. Let's say it's on my heart. That MRI, having um, exposed the sin, is powerless to remove it. Because the law comes down to three different types of command, or three different chapters, essentially, to it. There's number one, you sh should do this. You need to do this thing because it's good for you. Number two is do not do this thing because it is bad for you. And number three is when you inevitably do the thing that I said not to and when you don't do the thing I said you should do, this is how you repair the relationships that were damaged in the process. That's the, that's the whole thing. The offerings, the feasts, all of it is about remembering how that God's been faithful to his people in the past. And that's what Passover is and how we can remember that faithfulness and then follow that faithfulness through into holiness. Uh, Matthew 5, 29 through 30 is another verse that he then, he loves to go to, get rid of it. And this is another extension of how he's trying to appeal to legalism in order to um, create an artificial form of holiness. Now, him and I actually do agree here a little bit. And let me tell you where we agree before we go into where we disagree. That if your laptop, smartphone, tablet, computer, whatever, is causing you to sin, you probably do need to make some distance between you and it, put some... Um, software filtration on it because it's leading you into sin and that um, as long as you are linked up literally to an IV of poison dripping into your body you will never be healthy however if I was to get rid of all of my digital smart technology and yet I still battled lust for instance I would still fight against that lust. I would just find another way to express it because that's what my flesh is. That's what Romans 7 is. That's what 
um, the whole of Galatians is. That's what James is trying to get to, that if we could control our tongues, we'd be imperfect in every other way, except that it's literally set on fire by hell itself. Like I said, this is just my second response to him. There's probably going to be more, but what this really comes down to is that this is a naive worldview based on false biblical anthropology that um, does not conform to the reality of Scripture. The one question that is the most important regarding all of this, all of it, is that if it is possible for a person to, through discipline or through um, ritualized obedience, to be perfect and holy in his own, on, on his own merit, then why did Jesus Christ have to come to the earth and die? If you want to have the freedom that comes from assurance of salvation, you have to rest on the grace of Christ through faith alone. Because if it's on you, and it's on you to earn it, and then on you to keep it, then you will continually fail no matter what. So I think that it's the height of arrogance, which is pride is a sin, right? Pride gives birth to death, um, to say that it's even possible to be sinless in this life when we've seen from the example of Christendom and the narrative of Scripture that it can't be done. Because if it could be done, the people who are credited with authorship in Scripture itself would have done it. So um, I guess that's it. Um, if you're liking what you're seeing, great. Um, if you don't, I want that more. I love hate comments. Um, I've actually started to get a little bit of feedback, and I like that. Um, maybe tell me what you want to see, maybe, or send me some links of stuff that you think I should see.